Hey guys, welcome back to AdMix for another episode of Giving the Game Away. And today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. Uh, instead of only talking about games, we're going to talk about the future of advertising and how iOS 14 specifically might affect it. And joining me, as always, Ian, how are you doing? I am good. How are you, Sam? I'm good, man. Good, good. Surviving. Surviving. Um, you you have a IDFA is a particular place in your heart, doesn't it? You're very passionate about the topic. Well, I'm passionate about anything that can make advertising better for the end customer, um, mm -hmm. and as a result of that, I like what uh, this discussion is all about. Mm. Um, I do think this is going to cause some challenges, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. But um, you know, when I when I first started having the idea of AdMix, I started to network in the advertising space. And I remember mm. going some for some conferences, sometimes two or three days. And in these conferences, for the two or three days, you didn't hear anyone talking about the customers. It was all about publishers, advertisers, how you can maximize revenue for one, maximize targeting for another. And they forgot that people who actually see the ads are the users. Mm -hmm. And I thought for me, you know, it's it's not a two-way relationship. It's a, yeah. a three-way uh, marketplace. The user is a central piece of it. So anything that can bring the user at the center of it for me is is a good thing. So mm. let's talk about that. Okay, excellent. So um, I guess it's probably good to get some background in first. Um, yes, what is the idea? Yeah, yeah. back in June, um, to give some context, Apple announced the release of iOS 14, um, which is the latest software update, which I'm sure everyone knows. The main thing that advertisers started talking about was this IDFA policy that they were changing. Um, and the IDFA itself stands for uh, Identifier for Advertising. It's, um, it essentially tracks you across apps. Uh, if you are playing a game and you see an ad for another game and you click on that ad and you go, it will take you to the Play Store or the App Store uh, and you download that game, that entire, that entire journey is recorded by the IDFA. So it's it's tracking you. It's tracking you as a unique individual. And for privacy reasons, that's pretty questionable. The user, most users don't want to be tracked. Uh, most people don't want to be tracked in any way, uh, which is why stalking is a crime. Um, it is anonymous, though, which is already a, a good thing. And yeah. um, users can already um, refresh it. So you can yeah. actually go right now in your device, very buried in like 15 different menus. If you go to settings, yeah. privacy, um, something like that, you can actually reset your identifier. And it's kind yeah. of like clearing your cache or deleting your cookies. Yeah. It just resets from that moment forward. But mm -hmm. it wasn't very obvious. Um, wasn't and a lot of people, I think it's 5% of people who are doing that, right? Yeah. Although that was that number has been increasing recently, um, but not not by a huge amount, really. It's just people are gradually becoming aware of it. I'd see that more as a symptom of the fact that people are conscious of privacy, um, that, that some of us are trying. Um, but anyway, this is all a moot point right now because with iOS 14, Apple are changing things. Now, for every app, it will ask you permission as to whether you should be tracked. It will ask you to allow tracking or not to allow tracking. Um, which is, that's really big. That is, I think, that is a tr triumph for the end user in terms of privacy. It makes it simple. It makes it something that everyone can make a choice on instead of being, uh, instead of them assuming that you are fine with being tracked. Um, it's also a very clever move from Apple because they are not getting rid of the IDFA. Uh, so advertisers can't really be that upset at them. And if they do publicly decry Apple, then they look like the bad guy. Um, absolutely a win-win for Apple and definitely a, a great move for the general public too. Um, I, I mean, I can't imagine that many people who will say allow tracking. Will you say allow tracking, Sam, on anything? No, I don't think I would. Um, yeah. And I think I think the pop-up that will appear first is not one of these constant pop-up that the publisher will be able to style either, right? It's going to yeah. be default text. I think there is one piece of text that can be edited but it really looks like a system alert, not just something that you can try to natively integrate with your game. Um, mm. And it's really about, you know, do you want to be tracked? It's not, uh, you, we've seen some of these pop-ups in other games, which is about like, you know, help us uh, make a living. And, you know, they try to formulate it in a different way. Like this is not going to be that. It's going to be black and white. Do you want to mm. be tracked? And the tracking is about delivering personal ads, ads to you. 
Exactly. So I suspect that the, the ratio of people who currently are resetting the IDFA is 5%, maybe 10% mm -hmm. now. I think this is going to be flipped on his head. Um, and I suspect mm -hmm. that 90% of people will not want to be tracked. Why would they? Yeah, exactly. There's nothing in it for them. Um, so obviously, this is going to have a huge impact on advertisers and advertising in general, especially in the mobile game space. Uh, for publishers and for um, performance advertisers, it's going to be really hard to know where the where where your money is most useful. You could, you don't know which ads are getting the most return. You don't know which ads are converting, um, which is going to really fog up the entire environment for them. There's going to be a lot of problem solving. Um, yeah, I, I think really they're going to have to change their entire uh, their entire judgment metric, like their entire KPI system, um, because this seems like a really scary change for them. Um, but I, I think, yeah, I guess the big the big thing that they need to look at now is brand advertising, um, which is a whole other kettle of fish. Do you want to do you want to give us a lowdown on brand advertising and how it compares to performance? Yeah, there are really two types mm -hmm. of advertising. If you kind of zoom out and look at the industry, um, if, we, if we go back to you know the fifties or the sixties with the Mad Men, mm -hmm. that's what we call brand advertising. It's about it's not about getting someone to buy something immediately. It's about creating that feeling, that p p positive uh, feeling about a brand or product. Make the the end user imagine what it would be like to own that product mm -hmm. and essentially become top of mind for a certain category, right? When you think about coffee, you think about Starbucks. That's what good brand advertising does to you. It's not about telling you to buy the coffee just yet, but by the time you're ready to buy, you're conditioned to actually go and, uh, and think about that brand first. Mm -hmm. And it's been proven that brands that are top of mind generally capture about 70% of the, the market share in their category. So becoming top of mind is, although a non-measurable thing, it's mm. a massive thing when it comes to marketing. So this is what advertising was looking like pretty much all the way from the early days of advertising, TV advertising becoming, of course, the main way to push that message yeah. all the way to the internet. And then the internet, because of its design and the way that it's consumed, has really changed that um, mm. and we've seen the birth of performance advertising mm. and performance advertising as opposed to creating these big messages these big campaigns is all about direct response it's about showing an ad to someone and immediately getting them to take action download a white paper buy this product sign up for this uh, share with your friend any action that it might be mm. and so of course this is uh, completely at the other end of the spectrum because for the first time you can actually track every action for every cent that you spend did you get mm. a download did you get uh, a purchase so it's a lot easier to measure and to track not just putting this big message in front of a million people and hope for the best so of course marketeers starting to um, embrace that at scale especially mm. with platforms like Facebook and Google all of that is uh, highly motivated by data. If you have the best data by your customers and you pretty much know what they want, uh, you know what they like, what they've bought in the past, where they live, um, even almost their state of mind and uh, potentially their online behavior, then you know you can really maximize your budget and only show ads to people that are likely to 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 answer positively mm -hmm. to those ads. And so the industry has moved from brand to performance yeah. and really lost the art of advertising and now 80 percent of the spend on mobile is performance is all about mm -hmm. you know interstitial ads that are going to interrupt you and you have to click yeah. on this button and they use we've talked about misleading ads as well that you yeah. know everything is done to optimize those kpis which are very much similar to a drug effectively mm -hmm. it's you know if you stop if the brand stops spending the yeah. results stop as well you yeah. don't I, mean, way, you know, I like to think of the the difference between them as like short term brand benefit and long term brand benefit. Yeah. Short term is obviously performance marketing because all you're trying to do is get a short term return on investment, whereas the long term stuff is brand advertising because that's trying to change people's opinions about your brand. Um, I think the the short term performance marketing has definitely been encouraged by trends like hyper casual gaming, where the aim isn't to build a franchise but to get users on fast. Uh, obviously, this is going to massively impact 
hyper casual and a lot of those um, shorter retention genres because users are, yeah, you're not going to be able to redirect users in the same way anymore. Um, but that's probably a topic for a whole other day. Um, for now, I think it would be good to talk about um, how gaming companies need to change their judgment metric and what that might look like. Um, moving from this 80% performance marketing focus into uh, a, a more, you know, just a brand awareness and brand enjoyment focus. Um, it'd be good to get your opinion on um, how franchising is going to change as well. Like, are more mobile games going to attempt franchising instead of um, making one shot wonders, making really long term things, making things they can sell merchandise on top of? Um, I think that's a, it's a complicated thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the problem with, with brand advertising is that it's not easily measurable. It's not mm -hmm. something that you can put a thousand dollars and see results. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it used to be reserved to, for big brands, big, big mm -hmm. franchises, big names that had years to build this brand awareness and could spend millions of dollars to reach this audience. So performance advertise, advertising is, you know, we have to give it some credit, right? It enabled businesses, small businesses on the web, on mobile, to literally with a tiny budget, a thousand dollars already see results. You mm -hmm. spend a thousand dollars, you get you know ten customers. You spend two thousand, you get twenty customers, and you can just scale from there and hope to be profitable. So this was an amazing thing, and it's it's still an amazing thing. Um, but of course, it's been abused. That's the thing. Initially, mm -hmm. you were not able to target against all these um, KPIs, all these personal data. And then little by little, this platform aggregated more data to be more mm -hmm. competitive against other solutions. And eventually, um, you're able to track a user across across the web, pretty much knowing everything they're doing, what sites they go to, what they buy. And mm -hmm. you know, there's a point where users themselves are starting to don't, don't want to put up with it anymore uh, mm -hmm. because it's just too much. So it's a, it's, a, it's a balance. I think in the case of gaming, what we're going to see that is going to be interesting is if it's harder for game developers to target users when they do user acquisition because they can't really track users. So instead of this deterministic model where they know for sure, okay, this IDFA matches this one, therefore it's mm -hmm. the same user, they're going to have to use probabilistic models and try mm -hmm. to estimate, okay, there's 70% chance that this user is the same as this one because of all these other signals that I've been capturing. Maybe the behavior seems like it's the same or the time at which the user logs in it's matching the previous week for example right so they would use all these signals more signals uh personal signals behavioral signals mm -hmm. to try to estimate that as well but it's still going to be less precise and so because of that what we can the, the logical um consequence is that the cpm the money that they're willing to pay to acquire the user would be less because they're not quite mm -hmm. sure that this user is valuable or not maybe 70%, but maybe, you know, the CPM drops by 30%. And so because of that, this will enable other advertisers like brands, big brands who do not have the same access to user data. Um, mm -hmm. And therefore until now could not, not compete with performance advertisers because they knew so much about the user. They knew that it was super valuable for their game that they were, they were willing to spend a couple of dollars for one user to get, to get that download. Whereas for a brand like Nike or Sky or um, Tesla, even Tesla mm. doesn't advertise, but um, you know other brands, mm -hmm. it's um, it's the user is not valued at that much. It's just mm. it's just too much for a user specifically. But because the CPMs are going to go down, I think now this is going to create downwards pressure on mm. the market and therefore enable brands to compete against performance advertisers. So we're going to see different type of ads in games. But for games themselves, I think it would be very hard, except for the big ones. We've seen Rovio, for example, doing all kinds of campaigns um, because they can afford it or Supercell also doing TV ads. This is really um, only reserved for the big, big, big studios who can afford it, who can pour millions in a campaign without expecting immediate downloads. I think for the small uh, players, it's going to be difficult. And mm. um, I think they will have to focus on probabilistic ways to, to estimate and track the users. Yeah, I mean, do you, what do you think is going to come first? The, pro the development of better probabilistic models or bigger brands trying out gaming 
uh, advertising and gaming in the game space more? Will the brands come first or the development of better tools, I guess? I think it's going to be at the same time. I'm sure mm. people have been scrambling to find new ways to, to track users. Um, you know, the big companies definitely have so many other type of data points that they don't really rely or need that, that identifier. Yeah. Um, you know, Apple is actually releasing another way to track users if you use their own SDK that they mm -hmm. would be launching in the future. So there will always be ways to do oh. this. I think um, Apple is kind of taking a stance on privacy in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to do things their way. You know, this IDFA is massively used by Facebook, for example. Yeah. You can actually create campaigns on Facebook that are only uh, targeting specific users that have mm -hmm. been tracked. And so Apple kind of wants to control that ecosystem and say, no, we're going to do it on our terms. Mm. And at the end of the day, it's a positive thing for uh, users. I think mm. it's going to be difficult for smaller studios that cannot really rely on brand advertising. But I think now if you, if you forget about acquisition, the acquisition, acquisition side, and look at monetization, mm. I think very quickly these spots, these empty spots uh, left by um, performance advertisers are going to be filled by brands, big brands who until today were not able to compete, uh, mm -hmm. at least in the gaming space. And so you're going to see a lot more ads for big brands and the Nikes and uh, you know other other big 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 names out there that just want to reach an audience and mm -hmm. um, and will use games to do so. Especially in the um, mobile space, it goes without saying that there have been brands experimenting in games already. Louis Vuitton and Fortnite. Um, League of Legends and MasterCard using in-game ads, which is obviously huge. Uh, these are big cases because it's some of the biggest profile stuff, first of all, but it's also um, it's also legitimizing what we're saying now because those games, Fortnite, League of Legends, they are already huge. These brands are attracted to them because they know that they have such a wide audience that they get brand uplift and the halo effect just by being in there. Um, the mobile space is very different as we've spoken about. Um, it's a lot more performance driven. But now that that's falling down, more brands are going to be copying people like MasterCard and realizing that there is an audience in these games. There's, what, 1.5 billion people playing games every day? Yeah. And uh, I think 700 there. million playing hyper casual games. So, yeah. you know, a brand is looking at different KPIs. It's not about driving clicks, it's, it's about viewability, it's about showing their ads to the right audience. And mm -hmm. as you said, that audience is there. We have 1.5 yeah. billion people playing games. The only thing that you need to do is figure out where that audience is, which obviously the removal of the IDFA makes that a little bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. Some brands did rely on IDFA for retargeting and optimizing their campaigns, but not as much as performance. Mm -hmm. And so they will find other way, contextual way, probabilistic ways to figure out um, and, and serve their ads to the right audience. And we yeah. hope that overall it will be a net positive for the gaming industry. Yeah, of course. I, I've, I did mention earlier about the potential challenges that hypercasual, is, for example, as a genre, will, will face in user acquisition. Um, but we know a lot of developers are excited about this because it it's really pushing advertisers to try more player-friendly advertising solutions. Um, now that it's not performance-driven, um, a brand that wants to be seen and seen in a positive light, if they're popping up as a as a banner ad or an or an unskippable thirty-second interstitial, people are not going to enjoy that people won't have a positive effect of that brand. Whereas um, non-intrusive advertising uh, in various forms, even something like rewarded video, those are gonna become even more popular because they have a positive uplift effect. They don't annoy players in the same way and that matters to brands. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I think this is this iOS 14 is kind of like the first break mm -hmm. of you know almost unbuilding the way that advertising has been built and rebuilding a more privacy centric user first type of model mm. um of course the tracking is a big thing as you mentioned the intrusion is another thing um and i think more and more people are being you know starting to realize that this industry has really taken things far yeah. right i mean i'm a i'm a huge fan of advertising as a concept like the the, the amount of free things the access that we have mm. mainly for free playing these games, reading these articles, watching these videos, it's its incredible that all of that stuff is free and that brands are paying for us to watch it. But it doesn't mean that advertisers can 
and platforms can get away with everything. It still needs to be done in the right way. They can't just hide behind the, hey, we're powering a free internet mm. to pretty much compromise and sell uh, your data to the highest bidder. That's mm. not okay. And so I think we are going to see a more responsible future for, for advertising. And, and iOS 14 is kind of like the first step, at least taken by a big company, because there's always been people complaining about advertising, but a big company. I mean, Apple is the mm. second biggest company in the world. Um, so it's uh, it's a big thing. And I think overall, it's going to be a net positive. I'm just mm. unsure about the, the transition before we get there. I mean, I, I can imagine your answer to this already, but um, Apple, obviously, it, it's hard to say whether this was motivated by privacy and brand image on Apple's part or on their love of controlling ecosystems, as we mentioned before. I want to believe <laughs> yeah, it's the privacy. Probably the latter. I really do. Yeah. <laughs> they love controlling stuff. They love having end-to-end -end control over every part of the process. Um, it's also... Uh, an undeniable fact that Apple users tend to be worth more. They tend to spend more in in-app purchases. Ads on Apple, for various reasons, tend to cost a little bit more. Um, do you think? Do you think other platforms like Google are going to follow in Apple's footsteps here? With that in mind, that was a question I had for you. Actually, oh, um, really, I'm. I don't know. I think. Mm -hmm. They could play it both ways. So they could eventually follow, and you know try to, depending on, I guess, how popular that decision is yeah. from Apple, um, if they think there is, you know, it's, uh, it's beneficial to also portray Google as less uh, data hungry, mm. um, then they probably would follow. Mm. But I would actually think that the other option makes more sense for them. Like we know Google is pretty unapologetic about, you know, having access to all this data. They don't talk about it much, but we know that um, although Facebook got a lot of the heat recently on that, Google actually has a ton more data on you because literally everything that you use online, 70% of your time is so on some type of Google property. Mm. So, um, you know, if they were positioning themselves as the only ecosystem that still can track users, mm. you know, that spend that you mentioned that, that at the moment, although there's a lot more users on Google Play, I think the spend is reversed. It's twice as much spend roughly on the, on the Apple store um this could shift very quickly because mm -hmm. performance advertisers could say well if apple doesn't want me to to track it i'm going to shift my spend and now spend mm -hmm. you know two-thirds of my budget on google play instead so mm -hmm. they might keep it just to be able to actually compete in terms of uh, in terms of revenue so mm -hmm. um I'm, I'm in two minds about this let's see what happens i think mm -hmm. um yeah what, what do you think um i it is tricky. I think um, I think this idea that on Google's part, this idea that that might flip is kind of appealing. I think they won't they won't announce it immediately. Um, they will probably see if brands uh, they'll probably see if the current advertiser climate that Apple has goes over to them. So the advertisers that care about Apple as a, about iOS as a platform might go over to Google because they have this IDFA. The performance marketers who want to track people might all flood to Google platforms, which could be very lucrative for Google. Um, and maybe that is enough motivation for them not to take this change. I think a big part of it's going to be how much uh, how much we talk about it as regular people. How much how you know? I, th I there's an element of this where people are going to see that pop up and they're going to say, "Don't allow tracking," and then that's the last they'll ever think about it. They won't be. They won't be thinking about tracking or big data uh, enough to really understand how significant that is. And these aren't the people that are listening to this. These aren't the people that are interested in this space. They are just the 99.9% .9 of people who will be using Apple products. Um, and the more of that 99.9% .9 that talk, that say this is great and this is a huge move for privacy and an, an important event, that will put pressure on Google. But I have no idea how many of those people are going to talk right now. Um, it's a it's a thing that people care about, but at the end of the day, it's a pop up. That's uh, right. It's it is a big thing, but I don't think because it happens in the background, you know, for for the user experience, it mm -hmm. almost doesn't change it for an average person who doesn't know the whole details. And in fact, it's more of an annoyance. You have an extra pop up. It's just you know a bit more friction. I think. 
overall, I think definitely the industry took it too far. But I think a lot of people, although they complain about ads, still prefer mm. ads than paying for things. Yeah, um, advertising remains the better alternative right now. Because of that, it almost enjoy this monopoly of, you know, it's better than the other things. So we can do anything we want and we can capture all this data. So I think it's definitely a great thing that this is changing. Yeah. I'm not sure from the average public, um, what is the, if people are passionate enough about this issue and understand it enough to really push it and, and change the mind of a giant like Google. Yeah, uh, that's that's remains to be seen. Like 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 you say, this is a significant move. It's a good move. It's especially a good move for the gaming industry. There's going to be a shift in KPIs, which means a shift in advertising, which means um, more brand spend, which is only good for developers. It should mean more pressure for player friendly advertising, which is great for developers too. Um, it's just the future that is so like the far future that's so foggy. In the near future, this is great. I think it's going to make a lot of positive change, but what it does to Google, that's what I'm particularly interested in. And I just, I can't predict that. I think the immediate future might be a little bit shaky um, mm. because mm. the day where iOS 14 hits, I think pretty much all marketeers, performance, including brands as well, um, mm. there's going to be a lot of uncertainty, right? Mm. It's how is how are we going to reach our audience now that we can't actually know who we're targeting very well. So I think we're going to see lower budgets definitely for, yeah. for a period. Um, iOS 14 hits in September, you know, Q4, mm -hmm. which is traditionally the biggest quarter for mm -hmm. advertisers, for brands specifically, starts in October. So uh, it will be interesting to see if that affects the early spend of that. I think mm -hmm. as everything, right, we always think that this, these things might revolutionize advertising and stop yeah. brands for, from spending um it generally doesn't have the the that much of an impact like mm. you know saying that oh the idfa is going to kill advertising it's like okay well why advertisers still spending billions on tv ads right mm. where you literally can't measure anything or track anything mm. like they will find a way to adapt they have budgets that will be spent i think in the short term definitely they will be a bit cautious but very mm. quickly we will find another equilibrium and i'm just uh, very bullish that this will be overall a better uh, outcome for the end user which has been consistently forgotten by brands um in this advertising ecosystem mm, totally agree i think the uh the advertising world right now is up in arms and that's it's far too early to say that but i think it's going to be good overall anyway uh i think we just need to be patient and see and let it happen i think it's mostly performance marketers who are terrified <laughs> Which is fair. Yeah. I would do. There's a lot of, again, we've, we've talked about this, there's a lot of small businesses of that are relying 100% on performance marketing because they can't afford a uh, high production to do, you know, branding campaigns. So this um, definitely might be um, difficult, but at the same time, performance advertising is about 10 years old, right? So People have found ways to reach their customers before and they'll find ways to reach their customers after. This is really not a major change if you kind of look at, you know, the whole advertising um, industry as a whole. This mm. has been, you know, this thing has been live for the last second, right? Mm. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, they will find ways to adapt and um, people who adapt fast always end up winning. So we'll see how clever the, this market has become. Mm. Exciting stuff. I think that's that's a lot, isn't it? That's everything. I think we covered everything. Yeah. Excellent. No. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ian. This was great. And uh, for everyone else, hope you enjoyed it. Please follow us at Mixplay, and I'll see you next week for another episode.